Hello again. This is Lego once again talking about a project that I've made. Um, this one is a long one, which is why this video is taking forever. Um, but I just had this idea and I wanted to recreate a scene from the 11th Doctor's Regeneration. And you can tell here, the first thing I'm doing is always um, I'm doing the framing. In this case, the framing includes the tower because I want to write around that tower. So I need it in my, I need it in my framing. So the first thing I did was taking a screenshot of the tower itself. I wanted the silhouette of the tower. I wanted the recognizable clock piece. So I'm recreating that one as best I can. Um, and it's not the first time I'm making clockwork pieces. So I, I usually tend to make them in the same way every time. Um, by using a 12 pointed star, I get 12 points equidistant from another. And I use the nodes at the end of those points to place my letters, or in this case numbers, so that I know that they're equally spaced and has the same proportionality, um, regardless of if there's one or two um, numbers in the same piece. And here I am just tracing some of the core, um, some of the core silhouette pieces of the clockwork. So I just need to, I just need the recognizable bits. I don't need every line and shape i i'm just going for the the center piece that people can recognize or at least the 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 characteristics of the tower um, and once i have that just a rough outline i'm in a good enough shape that i can start to make my my actual text because now i have the frame i have the boundaries that i need to go clear of uh, and so it's time to start writing and uh, as you could tell there, I've started to, I've started to call my uh, style of preparation, or at least this style of preparation, as prototyping. No pun intended. Proto writing, as it were, because of the way that I essentially write the blank circles, but give them just enough characteristics that I can tell if I think about it a bit. I can tell how uh, I actually place my words and what it actually is supposed to say without actually going to the trouble of um, doing any cutting. So this is like halfway written text without using any cuts. I just use different color codes to mark what words are supposed to be cut and not so that I can approximately tell what every word is supposed to be even without the lines that denotes half the uh, half the letters. Um, this style is going to be similar to the other project I made recently, uh, the uh, the one with the title that actually got <laughs> uh, caught by YouTube because profanity in the title meant that it got age restricted. So that's, I guess, a bit of a bummer. But I mean, not really. Um, it just means that uh, I should probably avoid that in the future. But the point is. The, the style of this project is going to be the same. So I'm doing a lot of unfurled, which is the semi, uh, I guess, semi linear script, which isn't contained in a lot, in a lot of word circles, uh, interspersed with some important words in uh, regular circular sh Shermans. So the only difference here is that it's a bigger quote so it means, unfortunately for me, there's a lot more planning involved. And this is the reason, the sole reason this project took so long is because the sheer amount of planning that I had to do, and I'm not a fan of planning. Uh, I don't tend to plan out my works ahead of time. I just have an idea and then I just go with the flow. But this absolutely had a, a need of planning. So you can tell there I just jumbled out a lot of the words because... I suddenly realized I forgot a whole chunk of the sentence. So because of the way I read the whole thing, I need to reorient and redistribute a lot of texts. And it's annoying and it's tedious and it takes forever. So 
if I miss something here, and I did on two occasions, I need to rearrange a lot. And it's like a domino effect. If I have most of the quotes written down in proto form or in any form really, and I realize I need to shift the whole thing to make space for something more, it's going to be a bad time because there's a lot of text that needs shifting in that case. And it's not just a case of shifting it to the left. No, I have to rearrange the spiral, uh, make everything fit in new ways if I need to shift it um, because of the way everything interlocks with each other. Like that's the goal, right? You ha you want to interlock as much text as as you can whenever it makes sense. Uh, and so it means especially for bigger pieces, if you need to suddenly rearrange something because you missed something, um, it's going to be a bad time. So planning is everything. And in this case, I was simply not good enough at it because it's not what I do usually. Um, so I had to get creative a couple of times. I had to get frustrated a couple of times. And I had to do a lot and I do mean a lot of reading back and proofreading and reading again, because every time I return to this project, I had to sit down and look at the text that I made and guess and sort of remember what each word and letter is supposed to be, because you can tell it's just circles right now. Whenever there is a, whenever there are any dots, I add them, not in a very fancy way, but just basic dots. So I know that they're supposed to be there. Uh, I'll make them fancy and pretty later. But right now I just need to identify as many letters as possible uh, in as fast as way as possible. So that's why I have some color codes. That's why I use uh, dots, but no lines, no line modifiers, because it's going to take too much time to make pretty later. I'm just going to going to ignore them and just rely on my color codes and any characteristic sets of letters uh, combined with my semi knowledge of what the quote is supposed to be and just figure it out from there. So every time I needed to return to this project, every few days I had to sit down and remember what goes where and where I went and what everything is supposed to be reading as and then just go from there. So in that way, I had to do a lot more thinking than I usually do, which sounds like I don't think normally. Uh, that's not the case, but I'm not used to really working with such restrictions. Um, I tend to go with the flow and it tends to work out. So in this case, I can't just go with the flow because I have a tight framing I need to overhold. I have to uh, make some pretty accurate estimations of how much every word and every sentence is going to take up. Because if I don't, if I miss um, misestimate how much everything is going to fit together, I'm going to have some pretty serious space problems. Uh, because yeah, I could just scale everything up but that wouldn't solve the problem of not having enough space. It's pretty easy to make everything bigger, but it's pretty hard to make everything smaller because you still need to be able to read it. Um, so it's a tight balance to, to try and withhold or like respect, um, which again is hard enough when you know about how much everything feel, takes up. When you have no idea how much everything takes up, you just have to do your best to guess. Uh, and at this point already, you can tell that I'm one layer in. And if at this point I need to move a whole chunk of text along, it's going to take a lot of uh, alterations at every level because everything is affected by everything else. Everything is so tightly woven together uh, that I need to move everything if I move one thing. So I'm just crossing my fingers and hoping that I'm 
making some pretty accurate estimations of how much everything is going to take up. And I'm crossing my fingers that whenever I do a piece of circular Sherman's like right now, that I'm actually not taking up more space from the other layers um, than I can cope with whenever I come to those layers. So I, I'm trying to not take up too much space, but at the same time, I want to do the Sherman letters in the circular sections bigger because they're, they're, they're the important words. So it makes no sense if they're the same size as everything else. But um, that's just the approach here. Really, there's no, there's no grand plan. I'm just spiraling inwards and doing my very best and crossing all my fingers and hoping that it actually takes up the space. I hope it does. Uh, and then I'm just going to take it from there. Um, at first, the reason there's text in the center is because I thought I was being clever and thinking to myself, okay, but what if I start backwards? I can just add another layer outside. And that's true, but it also messed completely with my idea of how much everything was going to fit and how much space everything is going to take up. It was one thing to start from the center and go backwards, but I just couldn't cope with the sheer scope of how many things would have to fit if I went backwards and tried to reverse engineer, like literally reverse engineer everything from the last word to the first word. It just, I, I, I gave up pretty much immediately after just a single sentence because I could not simulate that in my head, how it was going to be backwards. Um, so I started from the start and it bit me in the butt in the butt here because I had a chunk of text that I needed to have fit in and I didn't have it. So now I'm rearranging one and a half layers worth of text. I think all of the um, circular Sherman sections had to be redone and refitted for new situations and new interactions. I had to alter pretty much every placement and the scale of all my texts because I suddenly needed to fit in a bunch of new text that I hadn't anticipated uh, in places where I actually thought I had already taken up that space. So I, it's sped up by 20 times here, but trust me, this one, this mistake took a long time to fix. Um, because at the same time, you're always struggling to figure out what piece of text goes where. Um, and as you'll see later, maybe that chunk right there, that chunk right there, I didn't get that back in where it was supposed to be when I did the reorientation. Uh, so now I'm just going through every single word and letter to figure out what that piece is, what it says, and where it's supposed to go. Because this proto writing thing means that I have a vague idea based on context on whatever letter and, and word is. But when it, you take a word out of context like that and it's not written completely out, then I'm just going to have to rely on a missing word to figure out what it is. And I found it there. And hopefully I only need to rearrange one whole layer of text to make it fit back in. And I think I got away with it. So. That was the last, no, second last mistake I made uh, in this project, stemming from the fact that I just couldn't anticipate everything to the extent that I needed to in order to pull this off without mistakes. Um, in case you're wondering, I had the actual quote on my phone at my side because all of my screen estate was taken up by this. Um, Sometimes I just have a little notebook on my screen so I can see it. Uh, but in this case, it was just too big and too much to to put on there. Um, but at this point, I am pretty confident I've got all the basic shapes. So it's time for me to actually do the first proofreading and also start on uh, making the lines go the way they're supposed to go. So until now, it's just been solid circles and arcs. Now I'm cutting them into pieces where they need to fit in the 
context of um, the sentence circles starting off there and just making sure that they don't cut into where they don't need to be and checking over the whole framing to see where I need to because now I have a complete picture where is the where, where there's a lot of space where there's a lot of um, empty room that I need to fill out just general density questions like that I can check out and start making some basic cuts to some of the circles to fit the fit the space that I need yeah I don't know there's not a lot to say here that I haven't said over on the other project with the similar style um, I'm using some because everything is so dense and on top of each other I use some different color codes for different circles so that I know uh, you can see there's some pink lines in there there's a lot of red but there's also some blue and uh, I think a few green lines as well and it's just to clarify what circles need to be cut with what so I don't accidentally lose a cut somewhere uh, there's nothing to it it's just a matter of being consistent um, and in this case I need to take every shortcut I can to make sure that my text takes up as little space as possible unless I know that I have some space to work with so a lot of stacked letters relative to what I usually do uh, I have more stacked letters than normal and I deal with a lot of extra space in a little bit of a peculiar manner I don't think a lot of people are gonna like the way I deal with this but in this particular piece especially I'm actually dealing with um, vowels by making them big which is a bit of a controversial thing to do uh, and it goes against the normal shall we say the normal uh, way things are done but uh, particularly my O's and E's and A's in this piece so everything except I and U I have made those pretty big on occasion here to make up for some empty space just because my reasoning is uh, the positions of the A and E and, uh, and the uh, O means that they shouldn't really be they shouldn't really be um, mistaken for any other letter especially A and O because of the way they're placed outside and on the um, the rest of the letters respectively so I've taken the liberty of making some of those pretty big for dramatic effect or for the purposes of the density of the piece and I know that's not gonna sit well with everyone but uh, it's good enough for me and uh, I'm being consistent in this piece I think I hope so um, I'm actually good I'm all right with it it makes sense to me um, and we'll just see how that goes but that was my idea at least to use the extra vowel space to make up for some empty areas um. now at this point in the destructive editing what I'm doing first is I'm focusing on the circular Sherman sentences first the uh, the big important words because they are the ones that everything needs to fit around um, so I'm just making them first cutting them up uh, making the divots and some of the other things that I need to do with it to make sure I have an accurate estimation of how much it takes up I'm doing that first and then as I go along I'll I'll see where I need to make some make some adjustments to the letter size because sometimes I have a big stretch that just needs to be taken up by a single word and that's that's when I need to go big it's just the only option um, especially towards the center because 
that's when I start to have everything made up in a way. So the, being done with the uh, circular Sherman's stuff, I'm just going over now the unfurled text and doing some scaling adjustments, doing some extra uh, adjustments to the thickness in some cases. And then I'm just going along and cutting everything up. So this is the point of no return for the um, unfurled text as well. If I find a mistake now, it's going to suck. But I don't think I did. I think at this point I've read this and reread it and reread it so many times because I wanted to be really sure. Because if I need to uh, do everything from now on uh, over again, it's going to be a pain in the butt. I do have backups. You can see sometimes glimpses off to the side. I have backups of the raw texts without cuts. Uh, but still, it's going to be a lot of work to to redo this if I find a mistake now in the basic uh, orientation or uh, in the basic placement of the letters. If I need to insert a new word now, it's going to be hard, shall we say. And now, having done my cuts, it's time to make the circles. As always, this is the most time consuming and frankly boring part of the projects because especially for bigger projects, you have a ton of lines and they need to go somewhere and they need to connect up just right uh, in order to not make everything unreadable uh, and weird and wrong. So lines, they take up a lot of space and time and concentration. So I'm saving those for last. They can fill up spaces that I couldn't fill up otherwise. And depending on how far you think ahead, they can really make some cool interactions between letters. So it's a blessing when it's done, but it really, it takes a long time, man. Um, and for this, I'm also replacing all of the dots that I've made so far. Those dots were just to make it easier for myself to orient it. So I could uh, better tell what every letter was. They weren't meant to be final dots. They were just temporary dots. So now I'm going along as, uh, as well as making lines. I'm also making the actual dots that I'm going to use. Um, so a lot of reorientation and re uh, distribution of those to fit into whatever I need. And I'm also doing my best to look at the grammar as I go along. Everywhere that I need to have a comma or a period, I'm trying to make uh, those happen as I go along as well, so I don't miss them later. But otherwise, it's just a long, tedious process of going over every single letter, adding the lines that needs to be added and where they need to go. It's just, there's not a lot to say here. Other than the fact perhaps that sometimes um, if I want a line that's visibly thicker than the letter it attaches to, sometimes it doesn't work out without extensive modifications of the nodes themselves. And in that case, I'm going to wait until it gets turned into a path before I actually manipulate those. Uh, it's just easier to do that that way because then I can deal with problems like um, the thinning of the lines when they approach if I have a rounded edge uh, and other basic problems like that. It's just easier to deal with it once it's a path. So I'm marking those off so that I know that I need to revisit those later. But otherwise, whenever I can get away with it, I'm just going to make them black stroke, no fill of course, and then put them in its final position and thickness. And I'll just deal with it later, once everything gets turned into a path.
the section you just watched with the um, the little arc there with the yellow text is one of two places in this piece where I had to get extra creative to get the space I needed because uh, in the case of those sentences I had a previous Sherman circle taking up more space than it uh, probably was allowed to and that resulted in the fact that I didn't have the space necessary in the next layer in so I had to get creative and in this case I decided to flip the actual unfurled uh, sentence line the uh, the circle that the whole letter follows the letter circle I suppose it's letter circles I had to flip that around and make it concentric to the outer layer in order to actually fit in the words that I needed. This has the consequence of flipping the whole um, the whole object that I'm cutting into whenever I make B stems and T stems. So this means I have to deal with it after it gets turned into a path because doing so now would do the reverse of what I need to do with those cuts. So I'm leaving those off as well. It's not um, like it, it's not a very elegant solution, but I suppose once you're done with the hard work, it looks extra interesting because it it's a flipped word in the whole script. So it, it stands out a bit like that for that reason, because the whole orientation of the text is um, is turned inside out, so to speak relative to the rest of the text so it i mean effect wise it's a really cool effect but it's not easy to work with and make it look good and i'm not sure i succeeded in that but i had to do it on a whim because otherwise i wouldn't have the space i needed to actually write the letters so it was a necessary evil i suppose although it it, it did look pretty cool at the end so i'm not complaining I'm not complaining with the result. I'm just complaining about the fact that I had to do it. Because it just means more planning for me. And I don't like that. One of the things that I leaned into even more in this project that I did on the last uh, the last project in this style is the use of circular lines line modifiers that are almost complete but not quite complete uh, so you'll see that a lot of times also especially this project where I uh, have a line modifier just extend just shy of where it connects to something else so it's not technically a line modifier on the other end it just looks like that um, i really like that effect even though i probably shouldn't use it as much as i am but uh, i mean it works out and it takes up a little space which is nice and it's more effective uh, when used on a s bigger scale like small scale, that technique doesn't really lend itself to much use. But on a bigger scale like this, it really uh, it really shines, I think. Yeah, you can tell here as an example, using line modifiers that almost touch that which they aren't supposed to touch, but then it still gives the illusion of like having extra circles thrown in there just for extra flair, and I quite like it. It makes uh, it makes it easier to deal sometimes with a line because the other question is where does this line go where does it have to end does it have to end on something what is that supposed to be can it connect up with something else uh, how far is that going to go and how much space is it going to take up if you do these small circular almost meeting 
uh, line segments that then you don't have to take up a lot of space beyond the letter itself which might make your planning a lot easier um, because it's pretty compact like I just made three, uh, three lines there for an S and it didn't take up more space than a single letter which is pretty nice especially when you don't know where else to put your lines now that buck you just saw there with the extra uh, node at the corner there that gave me some problems with the uh, meter the sharpness of the corner it went into overdrive and uh, made an extra sharp piece that was technically speaking uh, zero width apart which made it uh, go haywire that is a pretty old bug and I actually heard it was uh, fixed or at least it's going to be fixed in the 1.3.1 update of Inkscape and if that's the case I'm going to be pretty happy because that is one of the oldest bugs that still well bug me uh, whenever I do pieces when I especially when I do complex um, letters and words with a lot of sharp edges uh, sometimes they crop up and you don't always find them until it's too late because you can still deal with it as long as it's not a path once it's a path it's too late it's gone uh, you'll never you'll never be able to fix it unless you have a backup of the uh, uncut piece. But if they get rid of that extra node that accidentally spawns in the uh, in the sharp corners, I'll be very happy. It's been bugging me for a long time. I also think actually this is the first project I've made where I'm actually using um, actual numbers integrated into the regular text um, I've made number pieces before I've made math pieces before but I've never actually made ah uh, that's not quite true I haven't made a public project with both numbers and text uh, so that's a that's a milestone I suppose first time I've used that not a very uh, big use of numbers but at least it's a worse, it's a use of numbers. Um, so now the trick is for this piece to be consistent so I don't make the same mistake on a TH stem, which I think I have done, but I've done it tastefully enough, hopefully that it's clear what is text and what is not text, or like what is numbers and what is not numbers. Now at this point of the project, I'm separating more clearly what is meant to be belonging to the unfurled sections and what is supposed to be belonging to the um, circular Sherman section. So I, whenever I, whenever when I get to the coloring, when, so I can um, better separate it and do the effects that I want on the layers that I want. So. That was just a check of that to make sure that lines were assigned to their proper layers. And now I'm splitting up the individual words in the unfurled section. Again, using the very crude and very rough um, tactic of just deleting segments of the circle as I go. Which certainly works. It's not very elegant. It's not very permanent. And it's certainly not reversible. So I have to be very sure that this is where I actually want my cut to be. Um, if someone made, like the proper way to do this would be to actually split the word circle that they all share into X number of copies and then make each copy into an arc using the nodes so that it's reversible and dynamic so that I can change it later and actually still retain control over every aspect of the uh, circular shapes and properties and also recreate 
another arc from that same seed if I need to. But here I'm just crudely cutting into it uh, and crossing my fingers. I don't need to redo it ever because that would be a ton of work. So this is one of the uh, many, many read-throughs, uh, proofreading and just going along, making small tweaks and additions, because I have at this point a pretty good idea of how much everything takes up space-wise, and I have a pretty good idea of um, the whole scale and the, um, what's it called, the, um, like the framing, um, I've forgotten what it's called right now. But anyway, I'm, I'm just going over it, making sure everything looks as I think it should be. Uh, if the flow, if it can be read, uh, and then I'm just making some simple adjustments like that uh, last letter there. It wasn't concentric because I changed some things earlier. So I just grabbed the bag up and remade that section into a... Uh, into a concentric circle instead. At this point, I am ready to make the actual effects. So I just, what I just did there was take the whole thing and turn all the strokes into paths. Um, I do that before I do the object to path because I still want to be able to edit actual circles and dots as dots before they, uh, they change properties into nodes and paths. So what I'm doing here is I'm going through all of the individual word segments and changing thicknesses as I go, if I please, uh, and modifying those few lines that needed to be modified using actual nodes uh, as paths. And now I'm doing some of the path effects that I want, which isn't actually a lot considering the size of the piece uh, I'm making here. It's not a lot of modifiers I'm, I'm using here. Most of the lines I actually kept as lines uh, throughout. But I did make a few tweaks here and there and two or three extra lines I added in afterwards because I was a bit too quick in terms of changing them to pass. I forgot to apply some effects there but I'm just doing that. And then I'm converting everything into objects. And then I'm switching layers, doing the same thing, doing the same thing for the Sherman circular words. And after doing that, I'm grouping them together um, and just color coding them so I, so I can see if I got everything I needed to get. So this is just temporary to see if I got everything. And I did. So now I'm turning the rest of it into um, object to path. And then I'm unifying it. So I'm unifying those and I'm unifying that. So now everything is ready. Now I'm making the background and the final coloring of everything. So I went in and grabbed some of the colors from the original clock piece. I grabbed a tracing or at least I just made a... Uh, made a clock hand there, two clock hands in fact. I did some coloring on the, um, the bell using a mesh gradient, which is way more precise than any other gradient type, but it takes a bit more effort to get uh, the way you want it. And at this point, I'm using some cutouts for the background of the, uh, the tower itself. I wanted to expose some of the rafters uh, against the night sky. So the easiest way to do that was just to do some color codes and just subtract some shapes uh, until I had the effect that I wanted. And as a last sort of detail thing of the tower, I made some random brickwork where I just did some, some cartoonish shapes and just copy pasted those a bunch of times in different configurations to sort of hinted some brickwork throughout the, the tower. Uh, it went all right. I mean, it's not it's not a masterpiece by any means, but uh, it, it gets the job done. 
and to add some texture, I suppose, I did another mesh gradient to sort of hint at some shadows that I needed to, to have. Now, for the fun part. The, the best fun I always have is when I do the coloring. Um, in this case, I wanted to sort of hint at the regeneration itself. So I'm making some explosive things in the center, seeing how that goes. Uh, and then tuning the text colors accordingly so that they can still be read. And I wasn't very happy with that, so I instead went with this route, which if you know how Time Laws regenerate, should look pretty familiar. Um, and just changing the, uh, the different colorings to account for the difference in light in the background so that everything can still be red. And it took a little bit of effort, but some uh, fancy uh, watercolor marks there and a little bit of uh, a bit of a star sky there in the background. And I'm actually pretty much done, I think. At this point, I have the lighting, I have the colors, I have the background, I have the text. I'm just adding some extra smoke to give it a real, like, um, to get the, I suppose, the real, uh, the real deal. And I think that's it. 13 hours of my life on this. Thank you for watching.